Dear viewers, today we have a very special program with a very special guest, world-renowned military historian, Professor Edward Erickson. We just celebrated the 99th anniversary of August 30th, Turkish Victory Day. In August 1922, after a series of battles, which we call the Turkish Independence War, Mustafa Kemal and his armies finally cleared the Turkish motherland from the occupation of foreign forces and opened the way for the establishment of the Turkish Republic after 600 years of Ottoman Empire. Our esteemed guest, Professor Erickson, will speak on the topic entitled the, the culminating point at Sakarya. Sakarya battle being the most critical battle of the Turkish War of Independence. This year, we celebrate the 100th anniversary of Sakarya, which took place from August 23rd to September 13, 1921, in the heart of Anatolian mainland. This brings us to the title of Professor Erickson's new book, the Turkish War of Independence, A Military History, 1919-1923, which was just published in May and can be now obtained from Amazon. This is what Amazon says about the book. It's exceedingly rare to run across a major historical event that has no comprehensive English language history. But such was the case until the Turkish War of Independence brought together all the main strands of the story, including the chaotic ending of World War I in Asia Minor and numerous military fronts on which the Turks defied odds to fight of several armies to create their own state from the defeated ashes of the Ottoman Empire. This important book culminates Erickson's three-part series on early 20th century military history of the Ottomans and Turkey, making wide use of specialized, hard-to-find Western and Turkish memoirs and military sources. It presents a narrative of the fighting, which eventually brought the Turkish national armies to victory. Often termed the Greco-Turkish War, an incomplete description that misses its geographic and multinational scope, this war pitted Greek, Armenian, French, British, Italian, and insurgent forces against the nationalists. The narrative shows these conflicts to have been distinct and separate to Turkey's opponents, while the Turkish side saw them as an interconnected whole. Dr. Edward Erickson is a professor of international relations at Antalya Bilim University and a retired professor of military history from the Department of War Studies at the Marine Corps University. He is also a retired regular United States Army Lieutenant Colonel with multiple combat tours in the field artillery and additional experiences as a foreign area officer specializing in the Middle East. Dr. Erickson is recognized as an authority on the First World War in the Middle East and Turkish military policy. He has authored 18 books, many of them on Ottoman military campaigns. He has published more than 50 journal articles, book chapters, essays. He is a popular lecturer, having many video presentations and interviews. Today, we are grateful to Professor Erickson for accepting our invitation. I also want to thank today's Task TV team, Erdal Shahin, Ezgi Esen, Bülent Büyükgezici. Yes, Professor. Erickson, the podium is yours. Uh, oh yeah, thank you, thank you for that that wonderfully generous uh, introduction. I appreciate it very much, and it's always such a pleasure uh, to talk to a Turkish audience about my views on Turkish military history. 
which I've been working on for almost 25 years now in different forms. So let's go ahead and begin. The first slide, please. I hope everybody can see that. This is the, the culminating point at Sakaria, which happens actually the centenary of what I call, what I think is the culminating point tomorrow which would be exactly 100 years from, from the day that, that changes the course of the battle. Next slide. So that's what, what my book looks like, The Turkish War of Independence. Uh, right now it's in, in hardcover. It's, it's quite expensive, unfortunately. Uh, I hope to see it published in the Turkish language. Uh, I have seven or eight books already published in the Turkish language, and I, and I hope that uh, at some point a Turkish publisher will will decide to translate this one. It is the, as Oya mentioned, the only book in English that covers the complete military history of the Turkish War of Independence. Uh, next slide, please. So, so what is a, a culminating point exactly? A, a, a culminating point, it's another word for turning point. Uh, the culminating point in military strategy is the point at which a military force is no longer able to perform its operations. In terms of the Greeks who are attacking, on the offensive, the culminating point marks the time when the attacking force can no longer continue its advance because of supply problems, the opposing force, or the need for rest. And, and this, is, this is a definition that comes from, from the, the world's greatest military philosopher, the German, the Prussian, Karl von Clausewitz, who wrote the famous book On War. Um, you may uh, be familiar with an American author named Malcolm Gladwell. Malcolm Gladwell, four or five years ago, wrote a book called The, T the Tipping Point. So what Gladwell was talking about was the same thing. There's, there's, there's a point at which things are going okay, and, and all of a sudden they, they, they stop, and, 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 they, and they go in the opposite direction. Uh, that's a culminating point. It's, it's a turning point. It's the point at which everything fails, and, and now you have to go in reverse. So the culminating point at Sicaria occurs tomorrow. It's the centenary of, of what I call the culminating point. Next slide. So 1921, this is, they are now in, in the, starting in 1919, 1920, this is going into the third year of the war. And the nationalists have been fighting a multi-front war. They've been fighting the Armenians in the East and the French uh, in the South, East, uh, they, they, the French landed at Zongledak on the Black Sea coast. Uh, and in the West, they're fighting the Greeks. And in the middle of all this, there are a number of insurgencies and, and rebellions uh, that, that occupy their time. So this is a very difficult strategic situation. But by 1921, the Armenians are finished. The French have made the decision to withdraw. Most of the rebellions have been suppressed. And the, the nationalists, led by Mustafa Kemal, can turn their main attention, the main effort, to, to the Western Front fighting the Greeks. Uh, it, 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 this is, this is uh, a whole series of difficult battles uh, as the nationalist Western Front Army, led by Ismet Ananu, uh, come into the year 1921. Biranji Ananu, the first Ananu, is a defensive battle. Uh, it, it is it is successfully won by by Ismet, who pushes the Greeks back uh, in January. Next slide. There's a brief delay, and the Greeks then come a second time toward toward uh, uh, Eski Shahir Palatla, and, and again they're stopped at second Inanu. Uh, this is this is such a dramatic victory that, as you know, Ismet will adopt the, the place name Inanu as his family name uh, in the 19, later in the, in the interwar period when Turks adopt last names. I, I've run across a number of Turks who, who have a last name that 
memorializes the participation of their family in, in one of these great battles. So, so this is, as you know, very common uh, in, in Turkey. Uh, so this is now we're up to March 1921. Next slide. Uh, Kutaya Eskisha here, and this also includes the, the, the battles at Dumlu Pinar uh, are all part of this. In July of 1921, the Greeks make a major effort to try to defeat the nationalists. Uh, they are they are running low on support. They're, they've got to mobilize uh, all the young men. So so this is this is an attempt by by the Greeks to to end the war or, or to bring the nationalists to a, a negotiated settlement in July 1921. It, it fails. Next slide. It, it's it's a it's a huge battle. Now who wins? It it, it, it is a Greek geographic victory. In the end, they they take Athion, they take Eskisha here, they they take Kutaya. Uh, but but it's inconclusive strategically. It doesn't win the war because the nationalist army remains intact and able to conduct operations. So the Greeks take a lot of land. But, but land occupying land, as the Germans found out in Russia, won't won't end the war. You have to crush, defeat, somehow eliminate the enemy army. And through Ismet's generalship and Mustafa Kemal's leadership, the Nationalist Army withdraws and and lives to fight another day. So so the Greeks are left with a geographic victory. They, they've got a lot of territory, but they're frustrated because they, they have not been able to, to bring the nationalist army to heal, to destroy it. So, so at, at the end of July, there's a, a, a consul of ministers. Next slide. Uh, this occurs in Eski Shahir. It is so important that the Greek prime minister, Gunaris, comes uh, to Eski Shahir to talk and discuss the situation. Uh, and he brings the minister of the army, uh, Theotokos, with him. Uh, they meet with the, the field army of Asia Minor. That's the Greek name for the army in, in Anatolia. Uh, and they meet with that, that commander, Papalas, who, who also has in attendance the, the chief of services, uh, Dusmanis. Now, the, the chief of services, that, that's the, the logistician. This is the guy that's responsible for supplying the army with men and equipment and ammunition and food. And, and they have a, a, a quite a contentious conference. It's, it's, they argue back and forth. They've got to do something the, because they're, they're out of money and, 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 and they mobilized all the men. They finally find themselves in agreement that that they have to continue offensive operations. They have to continue to attack the nationalists. If they don't, if they don't, they're they're going to lose the war. So so there there is agreement on that. But we know today from memorandums about the meeting that that there were four, and I call them ifs. If, if this happens, if that happens, then an outcome will, will fall in our favor. So, so in military terms, we call this contingency operations. Success is contingent upon the successful completion of certain events and circumstances. So, so this, is, this is a tough thing for the Greeks. And, and, and they make some assumptions. The ifs are all based on, on, on the validity of assumptions. And, and one is that the nationalist army is very weak and they have low morale and, and if they're attacked they will collapse that that's an assumption uh they assume that the nationalists will have to fight for ankara they, they didn't have to fight for eski shahir they didn't have to fight for kutaya they didn't have to fight for dumlupinar and and hold them forever they were able to abandon those cities and withdraw to save the army well, the Greeks believe that 
that Ankara is is the decisive geographic point that that the the nationalists will have to fight for Ankara, and they're correct in that. Uh, they 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 believed uh, based on on the chief of services input that the, the field army of Asia Minor could be logistically supported that that they had enough food and fuel and ammunition and manpower to keep going. Uh, they they also and 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 you'll understand this better when I start to show some maps. The Greeks could act faster than the nationalists could react. We call this a a decision cycle. That that the Greeks would be able to to march faster. Uh, and and catch the nationalists in in an unfavorable position. Uh, all of these assumptions, except for Ankara, are 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 erroneous. So so what are the Greeks going to try to do? They they are going to try to annihilate, destroy the nationalist army in an attritional battle west of the Sakaria River, uh, and and the phrases that they use in in their orders dissolve remove or crush the nationalist army. So so this is this is not a, a battle of envelopment. They're not trying to surround the nationalist army. They're they're trying to come directly at the nationalist army and, and, and in a in a very bitter pitched battle destroy it, crush it. So so that's that's what they intend to do. The next slide. This is this is kind of where they start. The bulk of the Greek army is concentrated at Eski near and around Eski Shahir. The bulk of Ismet's Western Front is is concentrated around Palatla. Uh, and there is a thin screen that that dash line of of mostly cavalry and light infantry that's 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 keeping the Greeks from moving westward, uh, except in a very serious manner. That's called the line of contact. So, so that's that's where they're they're starting out uh, on August thirteenth, nineteen twenty-one. Next slide, please. Okay, this is the Greek plan. Uh, the Greeks have eleven infantry divisions in in their army in in Asia Minor. Uh, they're going to send nine of them in this attack. One will move toward the Balik Bridge uh, and Palatla to, to kind of fool the nationalists. And, and the other eight will, will march down along the Sicaria, across the Sicaria, uh, and then come up behind the nationalist army toward Ankara. Because the nationalists must protect their capital at Ankara, they, they will have to fight somewhere Somewhere in that area between the the last arrow and the and the the city of Ankara. Now, is this a calculated risk or is this a gamble? This this is this is something that that, that military planners would talk about. A calculated risk. You could you can you can survive. You you can calculate the risk and and you can you can uh, mediate the result. There there are are possibilities to. To mediate the result, a gamble is is a complete throw of the dice, and and whatever happens happens. So I this is a gamble. This is something. If it fails, it, it, there there's no way for the Greeks to recover. So so this is this is really a desperate gamble. Next slide. Uh, I think this is generally misunderstood, uh, not only in, in my country, but maybe even in Turkey, that, that Sakarya is not a single battle. This is, this is a campaign. A campaign is a series of battles that leads to a strategic outcome. There are phases in this. And, and in the first phase, the Greeks are moving their army to get into the right position to force the nationalists to, to fight for Ankara. There's a second phase where, where after 10 days of marching, they're, they're tired. The soldiers have sore feet. Uh, they've eaten up all their food. They've got to bring up more food and more supplies. Uh, and, and there's a pause along, along the, 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 the Gok River. Uh, in the second phase, they, they will launch their 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 climactic attack, a pitched battle. A pitched battle is a, is a desperate 
frontal assault where 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 the where both sides are attacking and counterattacking, and it's a desperate, desperate struggle. That fails, as you know, and and the Greeks make a decision to to withdraw to retreat back toward Eskishir. Ismet launches a counteroffensive, and then he reorganizes the nationalist army from groups into army corps, and he launches a pursuit. So, so this is an extended campaign that, that takes over six weeks. The, the, the Greeks push one way, and then there's this climactic battle, and then the nationalists push the Greeks back to their, to their starting position. Next slide. So, so I, I think this, this, this slide says it all. If, if you look at where the Greek army starts, relative to where the nationalist army starts. And you look at how far the Greeks have to march. Now, this is, this is, there are some, some motorized vehicles in the Greek army. There are trucks, camions, camion lar, uh, and, but they don't carry men. They, they carry supplies. So, so the men, the infantry are marching. On, on their feet, and, 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 and they're marching for, for 10 days. And every day, they're, they're, they're walking somewhere between 30 to 40 kilometers every single day. Um, imagine yourself walking for 10 days straight. And, and then at the end of that 10 days, can, are you ready to fight a battle? Uh, and, and the answer is no. You, you need to rest and recover. You need a good night's sleep. You need, you need some good hot food because for 10 days, you've only been eating cold, cold food like, like, rat, like crackers and cheese. So, so this is a problem for the Greeks. Now, if you look at, at where the nationalist army comes from, they've only got a short distance. They haven't got to march for 10 days. They, they can march two days and then set up and then rest. And, and, and dig trenches and dig foxholes and plan their fires and clear fields of fire. So, so, so this is probably the biggest single mistake the Greeks make is, is, is to believe that somehow as they're marching, Isbet Ananu is going to just sit there and not do anything. So the approach march puts the Greeks in a terrible position. Next slide. Now this is kind of blurry, and 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 I, and I don't want you to focus on on the numbers and which core goes where. But but Ismet's main line of resistance, he you can see from this that that Ismet's main line of resistance, his defenses, he's got a lot of men in that line. The red is shows the the nationalist army, and he's got divisions, army divisions. Two men, Lar, two men, Lair, uh, lined up shoulder to shoulder, and so while the Greeks are marching, Ismet is preparing a line of defense, and it is a very professional and solid line of defense in the mountains, in the hills, on high ground, overlooking river valleys. So, so, so this is this is a, a really professionally developed line of defense. The Greeks come up against this, and they can't immediately attack. They they've got to wait three days to rest, to to bring up hot food, to bring up uh, uh, artillery pieces that that they can use to attack this main line of resistance. So, so time and distance work against the Greeks. Next slide, please. Uh, the, the, you, you've all seen uh, any number of, of paintings uh, about the Battle of Sicaria, and, and, and most of them look, look like this. They, they, they show lots of people, and they show hills. They show tall hills. I'll show you a map later that, that, that just shows you how tall these hills are, but but most of 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 
of the paintings look like this. There are, there are postage stamps. There are, are uh, memorial statues depicting what, what happens at Sicaria uh, in, this, in this short period of the pitched battle. Next slide, please. This is probably the most famous and well-known image. There's a photograph of Mustafa Kemal, uh, who's, who's all by himself smoking a cigarette and, and thinking. He's, he's, he's obviously kind of off from his staff thinking about, about what the possibilities are. How, how can we win this battle? What should we be doing? What should I be advising Ismet? Ismet is the commander. Mustafa Kemal is the head of state. He's the 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 the, the national army commander. But he's advise, he's down there helping Ismet with advice and 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 recommending to Ismet some 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 things that Ismet maybe overlooked and, and could be doing. So this is I think the most the most well known image of Sicaria. Next slide, please. This is a painting I particularly like. It shows artillery, uh, nationalist artillery, and it's a busy picture, but, but, it, but it just shows the masses of people. Uh, here here in, the, in, in the pitched battle area, there are, there are at this point about 35, 40,000 Greeks fighting desperately with about an equal number of, of mostly Turks. But not all nationalists are Turks. There are there are some some Jewish men. There are some some Kurds. There are some Azeris. There are some 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 uh, Yazidis. I mean, the, the, it's 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 a nationalist army. So, and this is the pitched battle. The next slide, please. This is this is this is the the pitched battle area. Uh, there's fighting all up and down the whole front, all, all the way from, from the Beylik Bridge uh, near Palapla, uh, all the way down along the Sakarya River and, and swinging east uh, in, into the mountains. The, the decisive phase, this pitched battle, starts around the, the, the 28th of August and it lasts in, until the 3rd of September. And you'll see on on the map in the yellow area the, the Chaldog. Uh, that that's that's the, the the decisive terrain. It's it's covered over by that that black blob. But there's another hill called the Ardich Dog that that are are bitterly contested in in this in this struggle. All right. So so the what I call the the culminating point the culmination point that occurs on, on the 2nd of September, 1921. Uh, Ismet writes orders to his, his subordinate commanders at, at 1.30 a.m. in the morning on the 1st of September. And, and he is already aware that the Greeks are losing momentum in the center. Their attacks are getting weaker and, and, and more confused. So, so Ismet can sense he kind of he's he can smell he can smell victory if you will uh, on the first of September that day the the Greeks in in a desperate hand to hand struggle uh, seize or conquer the Arditch dog by the late afternoon the next day the second of September the the Greeks the Greeks make a a, a, a final assault on the Chal dog and this goes back and forth. They, the Greeks will take the peak, and then the nationalists will retake it. The, the Greeks will. So this is an all-day struggle. But by by the evening, by the evening of the second, the child dog is also in in Greek hands. But the next day, those those Greek regiments on those mountains are so weak, and they they've had so many casualties that the next day, the 3rd of September, the, the Greeks attack again, but they're, they're half-hearted. They, 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 their, their heart is no longer in it, and, and they fail. So, so the 2nd of September is, is as far as they get. 
On the 4th of September, General Papalas, the, the Greek Field Army of Asia Minor commanding general, decides to pull the supply wagons back. So he's already making the decision to withdraw, to retreat, because he understands they've lost the battle. So the 2nd of September is, is that's the, 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 as far as the Greeks go. Next slide, please. So, so we, we have an expression in English, it's called the high water mark. If you go down to the ocean and stand on the beach and you watch the tide go out and the tide come back in, high tide uh, will result in, in, in the ocean coming up on the beach and, and it, it ends and that's the high water mark. That's as far as the tide gets. We use the phrase in military history, Gettysburg, for example, in American military history, was the high water mark of the Confederacy. Gettysburg in, in July of 19, 1863, as as far north as the Confederate armies ever get. So Sicaria is the high water mark of, of the Greek occupation of, of Anatolia. Th that is as far east as, as the Greek armies ever get. And after this, over the next year period, they get pushed back and then farther and farther until they are finally pushed out of Anatolia altogether. Next slide. So, so the first and second phase uh, ends about the 3rd of September and, and the Greeks start to, repeat, start to retreat. Ismet is, is successful not in simply stopping them, but he's been preparing to counterattack, to launch a counteroffensive. So as the Greeks are retreating, Ismet launches attacks to, to try to, to defeat them uh, as they're retreating. And, and he reorganizes his army uh, into army corps and he continues the pursuit. And by the 26th of September, the Greek army has been pushed all the way back to where they started. So it, it is a complete defeat and disaster for, for the Greeks. Next slide, please. So what happens after Sicaria? General Papalas moves his army south. So in September and October, the Greeks move their army south toward Afion Kara Hisar, and there's a, 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 a series of smaller battles down around, centered on the city of, of Afion Kara Hisar uh, in September and October. Next slide. The war, the war then in the winter of 1921 and 1922 slows down, and there's not much action. There's not much. There aren't many battles in that winter. But, but the important thing is that, that by moving his army south to Afion, the field army of Asia Minor is strategically and dangerously exposed in the Afion salient. A salient is, is a bulge. And we see on this map, if, if you see the, 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 the red uh, uh, bulge. That's that's where the Greek army is. It, it leaves them in a very precarious and dangerous position to the point where, next slide, Mustafa Kemal, Fevzi Chakmak, and Ismet are able to plan and launch the famous great offensive, the Buk Taruz, that, that is a catastrophic defeat for the Greeks, annihilates two thirds of their army and leads to the, the liberation of Izmir and the expulsion of the Greeks from the mainland of Anatolia. So, so this is what happens after Sicaria that, that you are now all aware of. Next slide. Okay, what, what are the results? What, what are the reasons for failure? If you read the Greek official history, the constant and dedicated enemy resistance contesting every meter of ground. So, so, so the Turks fought for every, every, every meter 
of, of land. This, they, the significant reduction of strength due to losses. The, the, the Greeks lose a lot of men that they can't replace. They, the inability to replace them, as well as the problem of, of supply, finally provoked serious concern. So, so that's why that's what the Greek official history says. Uh, General Papalos writes uh, a message to to the Minister of War on the fourth of September, saying the progressive reduction of combat strength would make further offensive operations impossible. What what they mean by both of these is is that, that the Greek army has taken too many casualties. They've lost around four thousand men dead and around 19 or 20,000 wounded from a starting strength of somewhere around 80,000 men. So, so, so they have lost significant amounts of men by, by the 4th of September and, and they're out of ammunition and they're running low on food and, and they're, they're the camion lar, the, the truck fleet that resupplies them is breaking down no spare parts. So, so this is a, a logistical nightmare that they can't recover from. So that's that's why the Greeks say they fail. Next slide. Well, what other factors influence the the Greek failure? Their their plan is contingent. If if you say I, I'm I'm going to do something, and there are four ifs. If this happens. If that happens, if that happens, and if that happens, if you've got four things that 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 have to happen to ensure success, uh, you've got a problem. So 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 the contingent nature of the Greek plan is itself a problem. And then the objective: will will the Greek army be strong enough in 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 a head-to-head -head fight against the nationalists in that head-to-head -head fight? Are they strong enough to, to destroy the Nationalist Army? The, the Nationalists effectively use the central position. They, they got less distance, shorter marches. So, so they use the distance factor in their favor. Mustafa Kemal comes down to uh, Ismet's headquarters and, and offers advice and, and offer, pats him on the back and says, you're doing the right thing. And, and offers him tremendous personal support. Uh, the nationalist leadership itself, the core commanders, the, the division commanders, uh, they are battle tested. They're trusted. They're proficient in the art of war. They're all veterans of the First World War. They're all veterans of the Balkan Wars. They have this huge reservoir of military experience to fall back on. And, and lastly, Time and space favored the nationalists. I'll, I'll show a, a map here and point this out. Next slide. This map says it all. The operational geography favored the nationalists. I've talked about this probably too much already, but, but the distances that the Greeks have to march. You know, if you march hard and, and uh, imagine walking 10 days in a row, carrying a rifle and carrying a military pack of, of 30 to 50 pounds that contains food and ammunition. Imagine walking for 10 days and then, then trying to fight a battle. A and your enemy only has to walk for two days and can rest and have a hot meal and a good night's sleep and then fight a battle. So, so, so the operational geography favors Izmit and his Western Front Army. Next slide. This, this is a Greek map, and, and, and I hope you can see it, because it, it's a topographic map, and it shows the kind of terrain that the pitched battle is fought in. Chaldog, Chaldog is, 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 is almost 1,200 meters tall. Uh, the Arditch dog is, is 1,700, over 1,700 meters in height. So, so the Greeks are at the bottom fighting uphill. So you're tired and your feet hurt and you haven't had much sleep. And now you got to try to attack 
up these very difficult and tall hills. And it doesn't end there. Once the Greeks have taken the Chaldock and the Ardichdock, they're 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 victorious tactically. But but they're looking again at at hills behind to the north. So imagine the psychological difficulty that the Greek army has on the 2nd of September 1921, once they have occupied these hills, the Chaldog and the Aradichdog, they're, they're looking at, at more of the same, which, which, is, which is tremendously a psychological disadvantage to those Greek soldiers, those tired, wounded, hungry Greek soldiers on, those, on the tops of those, those mountains. So the tactical geography, this is the worst place to fight a battle. When the Greeks are thinking about, about fighting such a battle and for moving toward Ankara, they're not thinking about, about this kind of, of terrain. But, but this, is, this is where they wind up because of circumstances. And, and, this, this is, and, and I hope some of you at, at some point can go to the Sicaria battlefield and look, because this is, this is really hard terrain to fight in. Next slide. Uh, what's the result? Time runs out for the Greeks. This is this is the high water mark. This is as far as they get. They lose the initiative. They they now change from being an army that's able to attack offensively to an army that has to defend. Uh, it it they're almost bankrupt. Their their fiscal policy. Wars are expensive. Uh, wars cost a lot of money. And, and Greece is, is nearly bankrupt and they're looking for a way out. Uh, they, they fire General Papalos after the Afion uh, battles in, in October. They replace him with a, with a general named uh, Chastanasis. And, and, and he's, he's actually probably a worse general. He, he's, 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 he's not a, a very, very effective general. So, so they, they 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 try to recover by firing the general and replacing him. Importantly, international support for Greece comes to an end. Uh, the British Prime Minister Lloyd George has been supporting Greece, and and this is the point where they realize that the new Soviet Union that's forming to the north is a threat. And, and the West, the British, the French, the Italians have got to choose between a small Greece or a large Turkey to stop the Soviets uh, from, from pushing south. So they lose international support. Next slide, please. What are the results for, for the, the nationalists? Morale, the confidence factor skyrockets. The Nationalist Army, they, they've beaten the Greeks decisively and pushed them all the way back to Eski Shahir. So, so this is an enormous, not just a physical victory, but a psychological victory that encourages the Nationalist team. Everybody from, from the privates at the bottom to, to Mustafa Kemal at the top. Mustafa Kemal finalizes his command team. With few exceptions, the commanders who win the Sakaria campaign remain in position and they train and get ready. And those same commanders in the following summer, in August of 1922, launch the, the decisive battle called the Buk Tarus. So the nationalists also, as a result of this, by destroying the Greeks' ability to attack, gain time to rebuild their army. And the winter of 1921, the spring of 1922, Mustafa Kemal, Rafat, Rafat Bili, Ismet Ananu, Fevzi Chakmak, they spend, they spend uh, six or eight months getting, getting the Nationalist Army put back together in, in, in training the soldiers, in organizing the, the forces to be able to attack in the summer of 1922. This victory at Sakaria shifts international support for the nationalists. The Greeks uh, are out, the nationalists are in. Lloyd George, uh, who favors the Greeks, 
is is outvoted in the war council uh, by by other politicians, and and the Greeks now lose the support that they need to to continue the war. So so this is a decisive loss, a decisive defeat for for the Greeks, not simply in military terms, but this is a huge diplomatic defeat for the Republic of, of Greece in trying to continue this war. Next slide. Uh, this is the command team that emerges. Uh, they, they, they don't fire the generals. Mustafa Kemal uh, keeps Ismet Anu in, in position as the commander of the Western Front, and, and he teaches him. There's a, there's a learning curve to high command. Ismet Anu in the First World War was a corps level commander. He commanded army corps. Uh, and, and, and then later on, he becomes an army commander. At the Western Front level, Ismet Anu has to supervise two different armies. In the reorganization of 1922, Kamal forms the first and the second field army. So, so part, part, part of this command team business is, is the idea that, that Mustafa Kemal, who's very experienced and, and very proficient in the art of war, is, is, is teaching and developing Ismet Ananu to become a, a very effective world-class front-level commander. Uh, Fevzi Chakmak is a part of this too, because it, it's not simply commanding an army. You, you need a staff that can support the army with with good plans and and logistics and and mobilize the people behind it. So so this command team emerges from Sakaria uh, as 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 really a, what I would call a, a world class organization. Uh, I think I'm coming up on the last slide. Next slide, please. So that's it. That's that's my uh, my view, my take of of what happens at the Battle of Sicaria. What I would leave you with is it's it's more than a battle. It, it's a six week long struggle. At the end of which uh, the multiple battles constitute a six week long campaign that the Greeks lose catastrophically, not simply at the military level, but at the diplomatic level as well. So that concludes my, my talk on Sakaria. Uh, I'm willing to take a few questions if, uh, Oya, if you have time and if you want to chat for a little bit. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. This is just... Uh just just beyond belief i get i'm a second generation of the republic and i'm very i grew up with the with the of the battle so this is uh, very exciting for me and you made it extremely clear one uh, question is that it's uh, this sakaria battle is considered to be not only the critical battle of the uh, war of independence, but a decisive battle uh, of the First World War I, two, uh, because it really did change, uh, brought a great change. And what do you think? It may not be as big as Somme and Verdun or even Dardanelles, but uh, um, do you agree with that? Was this, uh, can it be considered as such? Yes. Um, the the decisive nature at the, at the Dardanelles uh, by by the fall, uh, Sonbahar in, in in 1915, the 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 Ottomans have have have, a, have around a quarter of a million men. They got around 250,000 men fighting in in at in the, the Dardanelles against against the, the Australians, the British, and the French. Um, Sicaria is 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 much lower. It's about eighty thousand men on on each side. So this is about one third, thirty percent of the scale of of the Dardanelles. But but it is it is equally decisive. 
it, it, and it's not the size of the battle uh, necessarily that that determines its decisive character. Uh, it, it, it is the outcome. And the outcome of Sicaria is that the, that the Greeks have 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 taken their best shot. The 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 Greeks have made the final attempt to change the balance of power in what they call Asia Minor, what the Turks call Anatolia, and, and they have lost uh, catastrophically and decisively. The the Greeks will, will never be able again to be a strategic threat to the nationalist cause. Uh, it, is, it is in that, in that sense a, a decisive battle. Mustafa Kemal calls it an officer's battle. And, and I, didn't, I didn't bring this out, but I would like to bring it out now, that, that the officer casualties uh, among the nationalist officer corps, from lieutenants uh, up to, to, to general officer level, uh, they, 300 nationalist officers are killed, over 1,000 are wounded. Uh, from from a starting strength of around 5,000 officers. So, so why is this? The nationalist officers lead from the front. Uh, the, the best armies, the successful armies in military history, the officers lead from the front. They, they, are, they are not behind the lines telling their men to move forward. They are at, at the front saying to the soldiers, follow me. And, and that's what wins battles. It's officers who lead from the front and say, follow me. And they set the example, and that leads to, to victory at the tactical level. So I, I would say that, that, that that's something to keep in mind. The, the, the nationalist officers are, are, are willing, their hearts are in it. They show courage, they show determination, and, and, and that is a large part of, of why the Nationalist Army is so successful in this battle. Well, it's very moving. So Mustafa Kemal used Napoleon's tactic about uh, uh, Russian invasion. I mean, did he have this actively in his mind or was it just a good coincidence? Uh, did he study what happened uh, to Napoleon? Mustafa Kemal was, a, was, a, was at a personal level, a, a great student of military history. He, he, he actively studied and read his whole life. He, he read military history not only in, in Ottoman, Turkish, but, 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 he, but he read military history in, in French and German. Uh, and, and, and we know he had a library. We, we know he was very, very, very aware of, of the precedents set by, by, by military generals in the past. He, additionally, he was a, a general staff officer. He had, he had attended the, the war college, the war academy, uh, for a three-year period of studying. Uh, not, not only tactics, but, but military history. So, so there's no question he understood why the Russians had been so successful in fighting not just Napoleon, but, but also the Swedes and the Germans in World War I. The Russians trade, and, and, and the phrase uses, trade space for time. As, as the Swedes and the French and the Germans advanced into Russia, uh, they, they, they move farther away from their supply base and their logistics, and the Russians move back closer to theirs. So in studying Russian campaigns, we understand, Ataturk, Mustafa Kemal, certainly understood that, that like the French, the Swedes, and the Germans, as, as the Greeks pushed farther west, they became weaker, and the nationalists became stronger. It's it's an equation that is that is uh, insurmountable from 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 the Swede, the German, the French, or the Greek position. And yes, he understood that. In in my view. Yes, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, we don't want to take more of your time, but we can talk another hour.
for one or two hours. Thank <laughs> you very much. And uh, so uh, hopefully we'll get you at every uh, critical battle to speak on the uh, military aspects of the battle. And uh, it is really a great pleasure uh, to have you as a speaker. And thank you for your time very much. Thank you. Uh, Oya, you're welcome, and it's always a pleasure to 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 speak about uh, uh, these things that interest me to uh, a, a population and an audience of, of Turkish people. So thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Take care. Thank you too. Bye bye. Uh -huh.